Hi, I'm Nobuntu Webster. I'm an entrepreneur. I moved to Sandton to pursue a dream. I've based myself in Sandton because it's the gateway to Africa. The neighborhood of Sandton is alive. It's alive with possibility. It's got the most amazing vibe. If you need to get anything done, this is the place to get it done. One of the things I really love about Sandton is how it lights up at night. If those lights don't inspire you, nothing will. Sandton is the richest square mile in Africa. It has everything from shopping in Sandton City to five-star hotels like a Michelangelo for my international guests. It works for me to be here. There are so many designer stores. There's an abundance of clothes and everything else to choose from. Being an entrepreneur, I travel a lot, so it's really convenient to be able to get onto the Gau train and in 15 minutes, I'm at the airport. Business is important to me, but my family is everything. And that's why my family and I are looking to move into one of the suburbs in Santon. Santon has some of the most exclusive homes in the country, in places like Hyde Park and Sandown. A little bit less fast-paced is your suburbs like Bryanston and Livonia. Branson was a natural choice. It's got great open spaces, it's safe. My son's already at a really good school there. The Sandton gives me great variety, from an awesome nightlife, to beautiful places for lunch, to spas where I can really relax and recharge. Things happen in Sandton, and that's my neighborhood. And welcome to episode 41 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamanto Kumalo. It's a Monday. Uh, I nearly actually forgot it's a Monday. I mean, we spend so much time indoors, we actually forget which day of the week it is. But it's a Monday. We're back. I hope over the weekend you caught the episodes of the Developer Show and you really enjoyed some of the beautiful uh, estates that we got to profile with Umandisa. If you have any, you know, goals of moving into a new property, that is the show that you want to watch during the weekend where we're profiling some of the country's best estates and complexes and really giving you a taste of what you can look forward to when you move into them. But we are back, of course, on Monday right here on the Pub private property podcast and exploring different things that have to do with our property journey. Whether you're a renter, whether you're a seller, whether you're an investor, we cater to everybody and we really do create this platform to help everybody um, you know, better understand their property journey, make better decisions in their property journey and save you thousands of rands. And to help us save some of that money this evening, we're actually looking at when it comes to maintaining a rental property, who is responsible for what? I know a lot of us probably have found ourselves in this particular predicament, whether you're a tenant or a landlord, something breaks, and there's always a debate about who's supposed to cover uh, you know, that particular item. And the two, would sometimes argue, but it doesn't always have to be like that. There's certainly certain things you can put in place and even understanding who is responsible for what at every single point of that lease agreement. But before we get to that, 
conversation this evening. Remember, every single week we run competitions uh, where you stand a chance of winning that 1,000 Rand prize on Friday. And of course, we give away two 1,000 Rand cash prizes on the show every single Friday. And all you have to do this week is share with us what some of your property dreams and ambitions are. Whatever your property goals are, we want to hear all about them. You just need to comment right here below. And of course, you stand a chance of winning that lucky 1,000 Rand prize. But without any more delay, I'm going to welcome our guest this evening. We've had him before, uh, and we're going to keep having him because he is you know, a guru when it comes to us managing or better managing our rental properties. And of course, that is David Beatty, who is the author of the book, The Expert Landlord. Good evening, David, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good evening, Zama. It's great to be with you again. So I think, you know, uh, we're going to be looking at who's responsible for what when it comes to some of the breakages that we're going to find in our rental properties. Or if you're a tenant and perhaps you, you think your landlord, uh, you know, is leading you astray in terms of saying you're the one who's supposed to pay for something that's been broken. Before we even get to, to that, I think let's perhaps take it a step back a little bit and almost mm -hmm. look at at the beginning of the relationship of the landlord and the tenant. What are some of the things we should we be putting in place to ensure that we're able to mitigate things like this and other things? Because we almost want to know what's the foundation of mm -hmm. a good tenant and landlord relationship. Yeah, you bring up a very good point there, Zama. It is so important to set up your tenancy uh, for success, to make sure you've got the right foundation in place. And then everything comes, comes together for the rest of the tenancy, for the rest of the period of the lease. So the first thing you need to do is have a proper lease agreement, which is signed by both parties. That's super important. And on the lease agreement, it typically refers to maintenance, but we can talk about um, you know, the legal side of that uh, a little bit later. The second thing that you want to do is have a joint move-in inspection. Now that's typically the, the apps around that, the, you know, the online apps which can do that now, but typically a piece of paper which, which uh, states the condition of each part of the property and which both parties, both the landlord and the tenant sign um, so that there's agreement as to what the status or what the condition of the property is prior to both, uh, you know, the tenant moving in. And, and if you've got that, then you've now got uh, your template to then state if anything goes wrong in the property for the rest of the lease agreement, you've now got the template uh, to, then, to, to then cover any argument as to who did what uh, when it comes to damaging the property. And I think, you know, before we even, um, you know, go to how do we then manage it when something does break and, you know, what, what, what do we say when we say maintenance and who's in charge of maintenance, perhaps let's explore even that inspection, right? So when we're doing that inspection, certainly as both parties and perhaps more the, the, the tenant, what are some of the things that we're looking out for in order to include in that inspection report before we actually sign it off? It's basically... Um... When I do an inspection, you go into the property and you check from the, from the ceiling down to the floor and everything in between. So let's, uh, let's look at your bedroom. So we go into, is it, is it door working? Is the door handle uh, uh, working? Is the lock working? Are the keys in the lock? Uh, you're looking at every single wall to say, are there marks in the wall? And if there's excessive marks, that, we, that we're stating those. Is the ceiling looking okay? Is the floor, are there any marks in the wooden floor, for example? If you're going into the bathroom, you want to check that the again, is the door working and, and is, a, is, it, uh, is it being shut? Is it, uh, can it be locked? Um, is the key there in place? And then you want to say, is the taps working? Um, is the hot water working? Uh, the bath, is it, has it got any excessive scratches in the bath? In the shower, is it how dirty is the shower? How clean is the shower? So you're really going into a lot of detail. And for me, like if I were to, as an agent or as a landlord, I, I'm doing an inspection prior to the tenant arriving, I would take about 45 minutes to do a two bedroom apartment to do that inspection. Super important, you're talking about a 500,000 rand or 2 million rand asset. It's worth that extra 45 minutes up front to then, uh, to then state, uh, you know, to say what the condition of your property is. And I think, you know, when you were just saying you take 45 minutes, I thought to myself, my God, that's, that seems like such a long, a, long, a long time to inspect a two bedroom apartment, which of course many of us know is not necessarily that big, but as we are saying, it's quite a large investment because it could mm -hmm. easily be half a million rand, sometimes 
substantially more than that, you know, depending which suburb, of course, it is. I mean, if you're looking at a two bed in Cape Town, it's certainly more than half a million rands. So also understanding that you're not doing the inspection for the sake of just simply doing it and signing off, but you're also taking care of your, inv of your investment and understanding what's working or not working in your investment. So if there are things that certainly as a landlord, you need to, to address before your tenant moves in, you address them, or sometimes perhaps it would be after they move in that you are aware of them um, and want to fix you know, almost as early as possible so that it doesn't get more and more damaged. And this is probably something people, you know, certainly landlords don't think about that. The longer you leave uh, a, a particular thing in your, you know, in your property damaged, likely the more it's going to deteriorate. And by the time you decide to fix it, it's going to cost you much, much more money or so much more money. And it might even you know, have, have a ripple effect on another part of your property. Okay, can I, can I bring in at this point the reasons why a landlord should actively look at maintenance? I know we're oh, slightly... Definitely. Yes, I, yes so, let's actually explore that. Because I think so many landlords probably don't prioritize maintenance. I think some, especially when you're starting off, uh, you know, we're saying off air that so many landlords or so many of us, when you start off, you don't even look, you don't even think, okay, I'm going to be, you know, a landlord with many, many properties. Perhaps you've just, you know, qualified for your second bond and you think, I'll just make that the rental apartment. Mm -hmm. But there are so many things you simply don't know. Things like even budgeting for maintenance and the importance of actually doing that maintenance um, and, and the upkeep of your property. So let's look at why it's actually important as landlords for us to do maintenance on our properties. So these reasons um, I've come up with after managing thousands of properties on close to 18 years. So if we look at a portfolio, so we're looking at a generalization. I look at a portfolio of 10 units, for example. A, a well-maintained property, on average, will attract a better tenant than a badly maintained property. Because a professional tenant, the kind of tenant we want to attract, is going to be attracted to a good property. Second of all, another reason is that a well-maintained property is going to be more, more attractive and more uh, in the marketplace because there's always competition in the marketplace. We're competing against units down the road. And if we've got a clean and well-maintained property, we're going to, we're going to let that unit sooner. Mm. Uh, another reason is that one of the reasons, one of the ways we get return on investment in our property is the capital growth. And any property has wear and tear over time, and we'll go into wear and tear later, but any property just by looking at it will over time deteriorate. And if we're not proactively uh, looking after our property, our property won't rise in value uh, at the same speed of what the inflation is. So, so and let's, let's look at a million rand property and it's going at a 5% per annum uh, valuation, uh, you know, uh, uh, appreciation. So that's 50,000 rand appreciation of extra, extra value getting on your investment. Let's say you don't maintain your property and now it only goes up 2%. Mm. The cost of that 1,000 rand that you're not spending is actually costing you 30,000 rand in loss of value. So if you think of it from that perspective, it, make, it helps me uh, you know, and every landlord has cash flow challenges. So uh, I just want to be empathetic to that. It is tough out there, but do whatever you can to, to uh, bulletproof your property from a maintenance perspective and do look after your property. Um, it also, a well-maintained property will keep your tenant happier and means that you're going to have a better tenancy um, and a better experience on your investment. So, you know, David, we've been saying that we're going to talk about wear and tear. And I think this is one of those uh, issues that sometimes is contentious because you know some landlords don't want to concede that look there's general wear and tear of a property and as we've just highlighted the importance of you know maintenance and sometimes even when you do maintenance wear and tear um, essentially does happen I mean if you look at even your own property uh, let's say the wardrobes the built-in wardrobes in your bedroom you know after a couple of years where the hinges you know start getting loose or some of the shelves start being loose that's going to break and will need you to perhaps bring in a handyman to make sure that uh, you know it's fixed up sufficiently. So we see it even in our own homes, but sometimes with our rental properties, we almost want to turn a blind eye and pretend that should anything you know go out of place, that it's our tenant that's doing that. When in effect, it's probably you know wear and tear. Let's perhaps look at how you define in your book the expert landlord, you know, wear and tear. Because I think more before we even look at the difference between you know wear and tear and if something has been damaged by your tenant let's unpack wear and tear and how we understand wear and tear because i think that's one of the things that both parties sometimes uh might not agree on when 
it, I think there's, it's relatively clear what wear and tear essentially entails. Okay, so let's look at the, I'm going to show you, I'm going to um, tell you what wear and tear is, and then we're going to go through what the landlord and tenant responsibilities are around wear and tear. And, and if we understand these principles, then it's actually all very simple. So a wear and tear, in my, in my book, um, I've got a great definition called uh, wear and tear is a deterioration that results from the intended use of a dwelling, but does not include deterioration that results from negligence, carelessness, accident, or abuse of the premises by the tenant, by a member of the tenant's household, or by a guest of the tenant. In other words, um, a, a, a wear and tear is damage that naturally and inevitably occurs as a result of normal use or aging. And anything over and above that uh, is not wear and tear. So this is a real role and responsibilities. A landlord is responsible for maintaining all wear and tear. And a tenant is responsible for any damages which is over and above wear and tear. So if, there's, if I'm walking across a carpet in my bedroom, for five years, there's going to be a bit of wear on it. That's a landlord responsibility to replace the carpet. If I spill red wine on the carpet, that's the tenant's, that's me as a tenant's responsibility. So, so you see the difference is one is if there's a little bit of marks on the wall, because I've got two kids in the household and a three bedroom home, and there's a few marks on the wall, um, that typically would be wear and tear. But if it's, a, um, you know, if the tenant's been staying there for two years, if there's um, you know, some cookies on the wall which my kids put on, well, that would then be the tenant's responsibility to repair. If I, bang a hole into the, if I bang some nails into the wall to put some pictures up, that's more than wear and tear, that's damages which I must repair um, on the move out. And I think, you know, so many tenants don't sometimes realize that things like that do constitute uh, whether it's damage or negligence, and even being mindful when you have guests over, um, mm -hmm. that you're still taking care of the, you know, the property. And in the event where they damage something, then you're going to be liable to essentially fix it. David, we're going to go for a quick break. And to our viewers at home, when we come back, we will be taking, uh, you know, your questions and comments on this one. So do send them through. Perhaps you're a landlord or even a tenant, and you still have a bit of questions around who is responsible for what in the household. Or perhaps you've struggled to, you know, come to the middle ground with your uh, your tenant. Maybe you didn't sound that you didn't sign that, uh, you know, inspection that David and I spoke about earlier this evening. Now more than than ever you know what to do for the next property but then how do you manage it now you the tenant is already in the apartment they're already staying there perhaps you don't know how to best manage that one we'll be taking your questions when we come back remember you want to participate in that competition that we are running the winner is going to be announced on Friday where they stand a chance of winning that 1,000 Rand prize uh, where we're going to be giving it away and all you need to do is essentially tell us what your property dreams and ambitions are whether it's you know moving out of home and renting your first property maybe you want to go from renting and being an owner do share those with us right here below and the you know the winner of course is going to stand a chance of winning that one or rather if you participate you stand a chance of winning that 1,000 Rand prize when we come back we'll be looking more at some of the responsibilities of both the tenant and the landlord as well as taking some of your questions and comments we'll be back just after this
Welcome back to episode 41 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamantunga Kumala. This evening, I am joined by David Beatty, who is the author of the book, The Expert Landlord. And we're looking at, you know, who's responsible for what when it comes to, you know, maintaining a rental property. And before the break, you know, David was taking us through Firstly, before we even look at who's responsible for what, what is important when you're building a foundation with your tenant um, as a landlord. And some of the things that he highlighted is having a proper lease agreement in place. You know, some people take this for granted and you think you found somebody, they're working and you guesstimate that they'll be able to afford your rental, but you don't put in a rental agreement in place. You simply do not want to do that. So make sure you have that lease agreement signed. And then of course, the second thing that you want to do before a it moves in is to do a joint entry inspection. This is going to highlight some of the things that are working or not working in the property and you'll be able to create a snag list and I think as a landlord you're then able to address some of the things that both you and your tenant have found and you'll be able to address them and should there be any issues down the line then you're able to go back to that snag list and say well this wasn't you know on the list and so chances are it probably broke while you were in the apartment so that's a good foundation that you essentially want to start off on on that renter tenant um, or, or rather landlord and tenant relationship um, when you're a landlord and if you're a tenant and perhaps your landlord doesn't want to or doesn't know of a, uh, you know that inspection make sure that you say let's do a joint inspection this is what a joint inspection essentially is because here you are you're watching the private property podcast and you're learning more about this the next time you go and find that rental property you want to make sure that you're also you know safe and you don't have a landlord saying you've broken something in their property when in effect you either a didn't break it and there wasn't any inspection done at the beginning now david you know before the, the break we were looking at some of the the responsibilities of the tenant and the the landlord and you're essentially just highlighting and even giving us a few examples of what the wear and tear is and how the diff, like the, essentially the difference between wear and tear and if your you know tenant essentially damages your property we've already got some questions and comments from viewers at home who actually want to get a sense of what they're going through is wear and tear or who's responsible for you know covering that particular cost this one comes in from Ulinda Dalton who says who's responsible if a toilet handle breaks or a tap leaks um, or the water or the tap leaks and there's water in the sink. So the tap for the water in the sink. Um, that, that the first answer to that would be looking at your lease agreements. Some of the smaller items inside a property are often the tenant's responsibility. For example, the, the tap washers, that's a tenant's responsibility to replace. Um, if the, um, and, and the, the, you know, the, the toilet handle one is a really good example because is it wear and tear or is it because the tenant was was pushing that was flushing it too straight, hard and the, the the way we as agents typically uh, and our landlords typically you know differentiate that is the contractor that's repairing that would then give a report to say this look this this toilet handle clearly is about 10 years old it needs to be had needed to be replaced at some stage or if you know if the landlord maybe got a record that six months ago he replaced that very that very fitting and he can improve to the tenant that in fact, um, you know, it was definitely because of, of um, excessive, excessive handling. So those are the areas where I, I propose that the landlord and a tenant are reasonable with one another, um, but then also first look at the lease agreement on things like um, broken, uh, like light bulbs, for example, and missing- I was really uh, about to ask you that one, it's such a contentious one. I've seen in a number of different groups, uh, you know, as landlords that I'm in, with some of them complaining that the cost of light bulbs is so high when you try to buy these eco-friendly ones that can stay on for many, many years. But the cost of that one white bulb is like nearly a hundred rands. And they're asking who's responsible for, for paying for it. Unfortunately, if the light bulbs, and this is why when I did inspections, when I do inspections, I literally note every light bulb that's not, that's not working. And if there's more light bulbs that aren't working on the move out inspection, then the tenant will be charged for the replacement of those light bulbs. So I think that, but if we're living in a home, whether it's our own home or not, there is a little bit of cost to living in that property. And there are a little bit of odds and ends like light bulbs, which is a normal cost of living. So of essentially, course, if the light bulb go out when a tenant is still in place, it would be their responsibility to go buy that light bulb because it's the normal sort of yes, living experience in that yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, it, 
if the, of course, um, I would suggest that tenants mark where there are light bulbs that are, that are not working when they move in, they must record that. Because so then they're not responsible. Because sometimes the cost of the light bulb is more, the cost is more about the maintenance man coming out and doing the light bulb than actually the light bulb itself. A part of me wants to side eye people who bring a maintenance person to change a light bulb, David. There are many things maintenance people can help us with in our rental properties. Changing a light bulb simply is not one of those things. Why somebody driving to your house to change a light bulb? There should be no reason why that is happening. But, but Absolutely are, none. But these are important things because, okay, my tenant is moving out and moved out is moving city, right? And there's a light bulb that's, that's not broken. The tenant is left, it's gone. Now what's going to happen? So this is why it's, I know it, I know it seems unreasonable, but this is why one's got to be so specific on the move-in inspection and the move-out inspection. Because it's fine after one year, there's one light bulb missing, that's fine. But speaking from a landlord's perspective, two, three years time, that little one thing there, one little one thing there, one little one thing here, starts adding up and now your property is not maintained. And, and along the way, you're now losing money because you should have charged the tenant for this damages and not uh, the landlord having covering those costs and another quick a comment rather this time around coming in from howard Mugetzane, who says he's been fixated with those topics and he's like and he says i'm even making a list of the things i need to fix before the next rainy days so i maintain happy tenant relationship and he says good evening to the private property crew thank you very much there howard and i think that's one of the things that we certainly want to do uh with this show is to help tenants and landlords to better understand how to manage our properties, whether we're living in them or renting them out, and where we can already make sure that we're either building up those reserves uh, you know, for our emergency funds, or even perhaps buying some of these stuff in bulk. If you've got a storeroom, you're able to put them there, especially when you're starting off. I think, you know, I half joke that I don't know why a, a landlord would need a maintenance person for one property, because oftentimes when you're still a micro landlord, you're probably doing a lot of this stuff yourself, but certainly as you start scaling your property as David is saying or I mean scaling your portfolio you're simply not going to have time so you also then want to put in systems in place that are going to simplify um, you know the process of your tenants moving in and out and you maintaining your properties so some a show like this certainly does help you in thinking through some of the systems you should be putting in place as a landlord and even the book um, that David has written the expert landlord is one of those tools that as a landlord you can use in better optimizing the systems that you have in place now you know David before we even begin to wrap up I think what are some of the things that our viewers at home should be mindful of when it comes to the maintenance of their rental property uh, with particular reference to who's responsible for what so say as a landlord yes as a landlord um, look I would make sure that I'm crossing my, crossing my T's and dotting my I's on setting it up correctly. So making sure, as you said, that the, that the, um, that the inspection form is up to date and then being very active to tenants. So a good midterm inspection would, would work. So every six months you're going around to the property and you're noting anything. You may not want to repair all the snags at once, but at least we're aware of what's breaking. If you're building a portfolio of properties, I would suggest like keeping a single colored paint. Um, when you're reading a kitchen, putting granite tops so that there's less wear and tear because there's plenty of wooden tops which I've seen damaged. Um, so over time, with experience, you get to know what is bulletproof and what is not. So, uh, and you're building some kind of consistency. You're not buying some fancy tower which, uh, which the tower shop only has once every six years. You're buying a tile which is as common as possible, which looks very nice. Um, and you know, it's hardy enough um, and priced competitively enough that you can, you know, you can, you can replace that tile in the future. So those are the kind of things that I would highly recommend a landlord doing. And lastly, I would highly recommend that, I know it's really difficult in these days, is to try and put some money aside for the rainy day fund for maintenance. Because every say five or 10 years, Let's, well, let's put it longer period. Every 10 or 15 years, your flat is going to get out of date. It's going to be really, really, uh, and your, your competitiveness in the marketplace is going to be quite, it's going to be very poor. So you want to do a bit of an overall, say, every 10 years or so. And you, you, it's difficult to afford that if you haven't put away a rainy fund, a rainy day fund. I'm actually so glad that you mentioned, I mean, some of these tips, even I'm going to use them and, and I'm going to, you know, confess 
when you mention you want to use a single color, for example, for your properties or a very common color, I made the mistake of after shortly buying, uh, you know, some of the properties, they did need uh, new paint. I painted them and the color that I painted, I actually had them mix the color. So also realizing that the moment you mix colors, uh, and you want like, let's say a special type of gray or a special type of beige, it's also substantially more expensive than buying just the standard 20 liter bucket of paint. Um, had that mix and I think two years later, I was painting again because the, the previous tenants had pretty much, the wall was just not in the right space for a new tenant. And I realized I can't use that color anymore because I can't find it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then I made the decision actually you're not going to do that, choose a standard color. Um, and I, the mistake I'd made previously was I painted the wall matte instead of glass where you can just like wipe it. Uh, mm -hmm. And now I learned don't do that because matte, it just becomes dirty so quickly. Somebody just touches it, you can't even wipe it. The moment you try to wipe it, it leaves this ugly stain on there. So even something as little as that, that not good, understanding. Super important. A good quality paint is worth every cent. And, yeah. and then it makes a mistake only once. <laughs> yeah, no, I, okay. after that, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think when you realize the cost of a 20 liter bucket of paint, you don't make that mistake the second time around, you don't buy a matte paint for a rental property, because it does get, uh, you know, dirty quite quickly and get it, you can't get rid of that stain, you almost need to paint over it um, again, and even that granite top, I think I was debating whether to get a granite top or not, and you think, I think in the short term, you think, oh, it's so expensive, you know, I'll save maybe an extra 500 or 600 if I just get uh, a wooden one or a glass one. But actually, if you get tenants who are going to maybe ruin it or the wear and tear is faster on the other kind of, you know, kitchen counters relative to a granite top. So when you take a long-term view on it, then you realize mm -hmm. that in the long term, you certainly do save substantially more than if you just took a two-year or three-year view on that particular, you know, fixture. So I certainly am as a landlord myself, going to use you know, those tips as I grow and expand my own portfolio. Um, David, before I let you go, any tips that you want to give our viewers at home, especially whether they're the tenant or the landlord in this particular uh, you know, situation when it comes to maintaining their property? Um, I think for landlords, um, be professional and be nice and in equal measures. And tenants, uh, be professional and uh, be respectful of the property that you're looking at, that you that you're living in, uh, and and yeah, know your rights. So and I think that's uh, such an important one, uh, David. One last question. I mean, you and you mentioned this: the importance of, um, or maybe it's going to be two last questions. Actually, one of them you you, you were mentioning the importance of having that rainy day fund. What kind of figures are we looking at? And let's assume you've got maybe two rental properties um, that you currently have. Of course, you've got a, a view of expanding your portfolio as you grow and learn and, you know, kind of uh, get better in a, or as you get into a better financial position. What, what is the amount that we should be striving for when we think about perhaps, that rental fund? Perhaps five or, t five or eight percent of your, of, your, of, your, of your income every month you're putting away. Um, I think that to present, if, you, if you've got a three bedroom house with, on its own earth, you'll need a little bit more for, to put aside than if you've got a sexual title apartment, because sexual title apartment, the body corporate is, is paying for the external uh, maintenance. So, and, and that's covered part, your levy covers part of that. So uh, I, would, I would look at an overall figure of around five or 8%, if possible. We've got a few questions from our viewers at home. Uh, Rene Shada says, um, how much does it cost to have a rental agent? So what kind of percentages of that rental amount? I know there are different figures that typically tend to uh, go to, speaking, to place a tenant around about seven or eight percent or like the first month's income. And if you want it managed, um, often agents are charging about a six or eight percent uh, per month after that. Uh, if, you, uh, if, if you want an agency to do a full service um, uh, for you, it's about 10 percent per month with, with no plus that with no um, upfront fee. And I think, you know, one of the topics that we're certainly going to explore is that, uh, you know, the importance 
or the importance of having a rental agent or some of the ways you can take advantage of working with rental agencies because I think a lot of landlords sometimes don't know how to best optimize that relationship um, or what the other parties meant to do. I mean, I've certainly heard landlords complaining that every month they'll get the statement and the agent will always get their money's worth, but they're not necessarily given um, you know, value for money uh, in terms of the service that they think that they're receiving. So we certainly will cover that as a topic in terms of what you even should be looking out for when you get that rental agent, how that relationship is supposed to be working. I promise, David, this is the last one. It's clearly a sign that we need to have you back on to help our landlords better maximize their rental properties. Again, this is another one from Linda Dalton who says, when taking down mirrors and pictures of the wall, uh, holes must be filled out. But if it's an old house and you're unsure of the current paint color, are you expected to paint the whole lounge with a new color? Uh, the short term is yes. I mean, ideally, uh, just that wall, if it's matched as closely as possible. But if necessary, um, it might be a situation you might have to paint the entire room. But, uh, you know, I would suggest that the expectation would be just, just to paint that wall and matching the other walls as close as possible. David, thank you so much. We're going to leave it there this evening. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. All the best. Thank you. And that was David Beatty, who is the author of The Expert Landlord, Manage Your Residential Property Like a Pro. You can, of course, get his book uh, from all the major retailers. It really does have great tools and uh, tips on how to better manage your rental property. And as a landlord, it's certainly an asset that you want to have. And of course, for more tips and advice uh, when it comes to managing your rental property, you can also go to www.privateproperty.co.za and go under our advice section and really look at some of the you know, advice that we have for landlords, and some of the things that you should be looking at when you are sourcing your tenants and how to better manage that relationship with your tenant. And we've also got advice for tenants. So if you're a tenant and you want to better manage whether it's securing the right apartment, negotiating for certain things with your landlords, then you also want to also go to our advice center and look at some advice that we've got right there for you. We're going to leave it there for this evening. Remember to enter the competition that we're running. We want to hear all about your property goals and dreams and ambitions. Share them with us and you stand a chance of walking away with those two 1,000 Rand prizes. We'll of course be announcing the winner on our show on Friday. You simply do not want to miss that one. We're going to be back again tomorrow with episode 42. Until then, stay home and stay safe. Hi, I'm Brandon Ribbing. Entrepreneur from Durban. The suburbs of Berea and Morningside are built on a natural ridge that overlooks the home of the Sharks, the Moses Mabida Stadium, uh, Durban Country Club. It's just got an incredible outlook elevated over the city. Living in Morningside makes so much sense to us because everything is so central. Anything that we choose to do is a couple of kilometers away or a couple of hundred meters away. Restaurants, coffee shops, it's all here on our doorstep. You know, we've got uh, great schools here. Uh, the girls' schools just close by are Maristella and Durban Girls College. And then fantastic boys' schools, uh, Durban Preparatory High School, DPHS, one of the top primary schools in the country, and then Clifton, which now goes all the way to high school. It's so convenient to be in this area where everything is close by. Some of our closest friends stay just across the Amgani River in Durban North. Durban North is very family orientated with some great schools, some excellent restaurants, in some small commercial centers. The promenade along Durban's beachfront, also known as the Golden Mile, got an incredible facelift for the 2010 World Cup and today is used by all of Durban's population. We as a family love the Durban beachfront. If we're not on the water, you'll find us on our bicycles along the promenade. 
Being a world paddleboard champion, I've traveled to some of the most amazing beaches around the world, but nothing comes close to what we have here in Durban. Durban has great weather and great conditions all year round for surfing and for training and just being in the ocean. And that's why it's known as the warmest place to be. We've lived here our whole lives and there's no place we'd rather be. And this is our neighborhood. Hi, I'm Clifton Smithers. I live in Belito, where my partners and I run a business called Union 3. As a family, we chose to move here about six years ago. What attracted us to the area was the safe and relaxed lifestyle of the North Coast. We're surrounded by so much natural beauty, and we love that it's so casual. It's just not as intense as a busy city. In fact, that's one of the main reasons there's so many people moving into the area. There's some amazing lifestyle estates out here. We've got some Bali, Brettonwood Estate, and Zimbiti, to name a few. The Belito Lifestyle Center caters to everyone's needs. There's also some smaller commercial centers like Tiffany's and Salt Rock. There's some excellent restaurants to choose from, and there's a really wide variety of activities on offer. From mountain biking out on the trails to surfing at any one of the beaches, there really is something for everyone. This quiet little town really comes alive over the weekend. The live concerts in the farmer's market at the Leachy Orchard is very popular. With the new international airport just 15 minutes down the road and the unmatched lifestyle that this place offers, it's no wonder that the North Coast is the fastest growing town in South Africa. My family and I absolutely love each other, and this is our neighborhood.